Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Amy Barrett, and I'm the Executive Director for ULI South Carolina, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our third installment of Living on the Edge, a five-part webinar series on climate threats and real estate investment in the Lowcountry in South Carolina. Before we get started, I have a, just a few housekeeping items to keep us running smoothly over the next hour and a half. First, we are recording this session and it will be available for ULA members via ULI's Knowledge Finder platform. Second, our panelists have agreed to take questions at the end of the presentation. So as you're listening, please use the chat box located at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions and we will answer them as time allows. Third, we have a lot of information coming your way in the next 90 minutes and there's even more to explore. To help facilitate a deeper dive into some of the topics we will be discussing, we will be using the chat box to post resource links that are mentioned throughout the program. I will also include these links in the follow-up email that I will send to you later today. So please keep an eye out for those links in the chat box. I also want to recognize our ULI South Carolina annual sponsors. We truly appreciate their continued support of ULI and encourage our members to reach out to these organizations when seeking guidance and support in your business. These companies are critical to, to delivering the ULI mission, which is to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. Now, just a brief word about this entire series. As I said, this is the third episode in ULI South Carolina's Living on the Edge Fall webinar series. This ambitious five-part series covers a lot of ground, and I hope you will join us on October 27th and on November 12th for the final two episodes. This series is a product of months of work and a shared effort of ULI South Carolina and ULI National Urban Resilience Program. I wanna thank our hardworking program committee who has developed this series and recruited over 20 local and national speakers who have or will have or will share their expertise with us. I wanna say a huge thank you to Steve Dudash at Thomas and Hutton, Jim Hamilton with Kimley Horn, Diana Pramar, Mar Eek, Leah Shepard at ULI Urban Resilience Program in Washington, DC, Jack Smith with Nelson Mullins, who is also our program committee chair, Aaron Stevens at Circulus, and Mark Wilbert with the city of Charleston. Thank you all for your time and effort developing this great series. I'm also very excited to announce Thomas and Hutton as the official sponsor of the ULI South Carolina Living on the Edge webinar series. Thomas and Hutton has been a strong supporter of ULI South Carolina from the very beginning of ULI South Carolina District Council in 2006. They were our very first visionary level sponsor and continue to support this organization in many ways, not least of which is the work that ULI member leaders like Amy Riley and Steve Dudash do on countless ULI committees, councils, and ULI South Carolina initiatives. Once again, thank you, Thomas and Hutton, for your continued support in supporting the mission of ULI in South Carolina. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Steve Dudash. Steve is a landscape architect and regional director for Thomas and Hutton's Charleston office. He joined Thomas and Hutton in 2014, bringing along 30 years of experience in land use planning, master planning, urban planning, recreation planning, and landscape architecture. A licensed professional landscape architect, Steve earned his master in lab landscape architecture from Louisiana State University and his bachelor's of science in horticulture from Clemson University. Steve's projects have won numerous design awards and have included walkable communities, resorts, neighborhoods, parks, and transportation corridors. In addition to his, his work on this program committee, the program committee that developed this webinar series, he is also on ULI South Carolina's Governance Committee. He is, chairs the Charleston Area Regional Transportation Authority's Bus Rapid Transit Advocacy Committee. He's on the Chamber, Board, Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and a member of Charles, the Charleston Chamber Infrastructure Task Force and the founder of the Coastal Transit Institute. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Steve to introduce today's panel. Thanks, Steve. Wow, Amy, thank you very much. I didn't know you were gonna go into all that, but I appreciate it very much and I'm excited to be here and excited that Thomas & Hutton as a uh, solutions-based oriented uh, company uh, we are thrilled to be the sponsor of, of this series. So thank you very much. 
and uh, I'd like to get into the meat of, meat of the uh, presentation. So I'm going to do a little bio on our uh, panelists and then uh, we'll get into it. So um, Tess Howard is actually going to start us off and she's currently the Vice President of Community and Development Planning for Alice Beach, which is a TND neighborhood in the Florida Panhandle. And in this role, Tess manages all the amenity and condominium development activities and is responsible for the financial analysis and contract negotiations. And you'll see that Alice Beach is highly focused on resilient materials, the systems and the maintenance. So we're excited to have Tess here and showing, uh, showcasing Alice Beach. Guy Hagstead is the Vice President of Parks and Civic Projects for the Kinder Foundation in Houston. He's an architect and urban planner who's a consultant on the Buffalo Bayou Park for the Buffalo Bayou Partnership and is an advisor to the Houston Parks Board on Bayou Greenways. He's the founding president and park director of Discovery Green, which oversaw its development and previously served as a special assistant for urban design for the mayor, Bill White, and was director of planning and development for Central Houston, Inc. Kate Kalignan is a partner at HNRA, where she helps communities implement inclusive economic growth strategies and delivers integrated development management services for nonprofit and academic institutions. And she's directed many complex, large scale planning community engagement initiatives, including a growth and modernization strategy for the Research Triangle Park, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's Delaware River Waterfront, one New York City's plan for equitable, equitable growth and a community-driven resiliency plan under the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program. She's worked on several projects in Charleston, including West Edge and Union Pier. Finally, Keith Bowers is the president and founder of Biohabitats, whose mission it is to restore the earth and inspire ecological stewardship by inspiring communities to rediscover a sense of place through preserving indigenous ecosystems, restoring biological diversity and embracing ecological stewardship. And he's a landscape architect and restoration ecologist. So we're excited to have everybody here. You'll see that there's habitat and ecological systems uh, that are in, in here and public-private partnerships. So it's a great panel and ready to go. Tess, if you're ready, we're ready for you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tess Howard. As Steve mentioned, um, I'm the vice president here at Alice, and I'm really excited to talk about um, sustainability in our community. So here's a map of Alice. Um, we're 158 acres. We're located in Northwest Florida on the Panhandle in 30A, on 30A. I think some of you may be familiar with 30A. We're definitely growing. Um, and we're entitled for roughly 900 units, but at this point we think we'll deliver around 800. And to date, we are about 45% sold out. Um, so the town was, uh, the parcel was purchased in 1978 by the Stevens family of EBSCO Industries. Um, Alice Beach was named after Alice Stevens. She's the matriarch of the Stevens family. Um, and the town was established in 2004 by Jason Comer. And Jason's actually the grandson of um, Elton and Alice Stevens. So uh, this project is really important to the family as is sustainability. So Jason put together a really great team to kind of form the vision for Alice Beach. He worked with Andres Duwani of DPZ, uh, a recognized leader in traditional town planning. And then also the town architects, Marianne Corey Vogt and Eric Vogt. They've been our town architects since day one. I think that's been um, key to our success is having that uh, conviction and them kind of um, creating, helping to create the vision. They've really helped to maintain it today. So they all came together with the goal to establish an enduring community through the use of traditional town planning principles, classic building methods and strong design. So I wanna talk about um, sustainability in architecture. I think our architectural style, uh, Amy, you wanna to go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, our architectural style, I think is one of the most important ways in which we are sustainable. 
um, Andres wanted to establish this Bermudan style in one of his communities for some time. And, um, you know, the family had a level of confidence kind of going in uh, when, when forming the vision because Andres designed both Seaside and Rosemary Beach. So we knew the T&D concept was successful. And we also had the benefit of building upon those experiences, um, designing those two communities. So when the Stevens family traveled to Bermuda with Andres, they instantly agreed we needed to move forward with this, um, with this style. And I think, you know, it translates um, to Mason reconstruction. So that's, you know, obviously has a sense of permanence and is sustainable, but also the white roofs and walls uh, reflect a lot of the sun's heat and help can help reduce cooling costs. And then, you know, Mason reconstruction can be expensive. There's definitely a construction premium. And then we also knew early on that there would be a premium to our land prices as well. We were one of the last significant parcels on 30A to be developed. So we knew when we selected this style, um, we were gonna need to build in as much value as possible. And I think we've done that with sustainability. It's added a lot of integrity to our vision. And I think, um, as well, we've had, we require two third party certifications. So all of our homes um, are to be certified green by the Florida Green Building Coalition. And they're also certified um, as meeting the fortified standard. So I think both of those things have just helped maintain um, our standards through the project. And I think it's really impressive that we're still requiring these certifications. Um, and I think we're one of the first communities in Florida to do that. Um, here's some photos taken from the trip to Bermuda. You can see how well uh, we have um, kind of followed this inspiration. Next slide. And then fortified construction. So I touched on this. All homes are certified as meeting this standard um, developed by the Institute for Business and Home Safety. And it's basically taking the Florida Building Code, which is one of the most challenging codes to build to just because of the weather events that we see here in Florida. It's kind of taking that to the next level um, with additional wall reinforcement, advanced fastening systems. Um, you know, we can withstand stronger winds than just a traditional masonry home. Uh, and I think this builds in a lot of peace of mind for our buyers but also create savings. You know, Marianne and Eric, they're actually residents in Alice and they um, have realized an 18% savings on their insurance costs. And I think that's a theme with how we've reflected sustainability in the town is that, you know, it creates savings, it creates a peace of mind, but it's also, you know, why Alice is beautiful, kind of, you know, the style is sustainable, the building methods are sustainable, and that's kind of all um, builds upon the aesthetics when you're, um, you know, driving through town or walking through town. Next slide. Sustainability and infrastructure. Uh, Jim Martelli is our civil engineer and he's been with the project from the very beginning. And Jason and the design team tasked him early on to incorporate sustainability into our infrastructure design. And I think you know, one of the most important ways that he did that was in our design of our streets. So it's, um, they're cobblestone pavers set into, you know, a fine gravel. And then in most cases, as you can see in the picture, we have a flush curb. So we're able to contain um, the majority of, the of our rainfall within the site. And, you know, the water when it rains perks through the streets and filters into the ground. And what isn't perking through the streets um, can run off over the flush curbs into our vegetative swales, where you can see we have um, oaks planted here. So this minimizes erosion and flooding and then also prevents runoff into surrounding waterways. And then Jim was explaining to me that, um, you know, runoff can actually reduce the dissolved oxygen levels in waterways, which can, which are required to support life. So there's, you know, an environmental impact. And then also, you know, just from an aesthetics perspective, the street design is um, much more beautiful than what you might see like an asphalt design. Um, also, you know, practically speaking, our utilities are located underneath our roads. So when we do require maintenance, we don't have to cut and patch. We can just remove a few pavers 
and then uh, replace those. Sustainability and landscape. So we've chosen to um, use mostly native and drought tolerant plants. And um, we've also prohibited the use of annuals and um, we also don't allow residential lawns. We do have some green spaces in our common areas, but um, we felt like by you know, not allowing the individual homeowners to have lawns would really cut down on the constant um, noise and air pollution associated with mowing those lawns. And, you know, just using the native and drought tolerant plants reduces our reliance on pesticides, water, and excessive maintenance and labor costs. It also, you know, um, you'll notice kind of walking through Alice that it's, it, it creates a wonderful kind of palette for the really strong architecture. You know, we aren't using annuals. We're not tearing out and replanting and tearing out and replanting. It's a lot of rosemary. It's a lot of Confederate jasmine, oaks, um, you know, all things that aren't reliant on constant irrigation. Um, and it's really works well with the overall design. And then lastly, I want to talk about um, an initiative that we just recently kicked off is a full restoration of our dune systems. Our dune. So our dune is, you know, obviously our first line of defense against a storm surge event. And we're going through a three-step um, process. First, kind of the preservation phase. They're trimming the dune, you know, they're cleaning up any debris, they're dethatching, which is just the removal of all of the dead plant material on the surface of the dune, which allows, you know, the healthy plants to grow deeper into the dune and help um, build a stronger system. And then also they're, um, you know, fertilizing the dunes. And then there's an optimization phase where they'll go through and add plants. And then, you know, routine maintenance and management where they'll go and um, continue the fertilization and continue to add plants where needed. So this, you know, not only, um, you know, helps against, you know, those storms that we're constantly seeing, hurricanes, but also, you know, improves the aesthetics and the look of our dune system. So just to kind of wrap up, I wanted to just talk about our commitment to the original vision. Um, you know, I think it was a true like defining moment of Alice when we hit the recession. We only had a few years of sales under our belts, but it was great to have the support and the guidance of the Stevens family and the direction um, to retain our vision, retain our standards, retain our building methods, and also to retain price points. So, um, you know, not making those compromises, we're now seeing the fruits of that. When you come to Alice, we're kind of hitting that point of like critical mass and the vision is just really, really clear. And you see it in all of the individual details. Um, a lot of the details that I talked about, um, it's just, it's really exciting time. And we're, we're seeing that in our sales activity as well. We're definitely seeing a return on, um, you know, the early investment. So uh, in the last year, just looking at our high season, which is, you know, March 1 to around this time period, we've seen over a 250% increase in our contracts written. And then also in the last two years, um, we've seen a 24% increase in the average price north of 30A, average home price, which is currently 3.4 million. And then we've seen a 17% increase in the average home price south of 30A, which is currently 5.4 million. So we're definitely seeing, um, you know, owners are believing in our vision and buyers are um, believing in it. And um, it's great to have the family support. So with that, I will turn it back over to Steve. Thanks everyone for your time. Thank you, Tess. And uh, Guy, if you're ready, please. I'm ready, Steve. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Guy Hagstadt. I'm going to discuss Buffalo Bile Park, which was developed in an area at very high risk of flooding. The park is the result of a partnership between the City of Houston, Harris County Flood Control District, and the Buffalo Bile Partnership, also known as BBP. It was planned and designed by SWA Group, and I oversaw its development. First, I want to provide a bit of context. The topography of the Houston region as it approaches Galveston Bay and the Gulf of Mexico is very similar to the Low Country and is at the same risk of coastal flooding. 
Houston is a very big place. and Buffalo Bile Park is located 25 miles from Galveston Bay. Our flat land gradually rises from the coast. And its elevation is 40 to 50 feet above sea level around the park. Also note the network of small coastal streams, which we call bayous, that are our defining landscape feature. They cut narrow valleys in an otherwise flat landscape with normal water levels influenced by tides, even 25 miles inland. During heavy rains, these waters can rise to completely bare in the south. With our heavy rains, the result is often flooding. This image is of the record flood of 1935 when Buffalo Bio literally washed away several downtown buildings. That resulted in a 50 year period of serious channelization of the county's bios, a number of which were concrete lined. Buffalo bio also was channelized, but not concrete lined. The image on the left shows the natural bio where the park is today, and then to the right after channelization. Also note the two high speed parkways built during this era that literally cut the bio off from the rest of the city. Grew up during this era when we considered our bios nothing but drainage ditches for floodwaters. The image on the left is on the doorstep of downtown Houston, and the image on the right is the park area in 2010. The land was almost inaccessible and was dedicated as a drainage easement rather than as parkland, with only a poorly maintained 1970s era concrete footing. BBP was formed in 1986 to address the civic embarrassment that Buffalo Bio had become. It spent more than a decade of hard work on changing the bio's image so it could attract major public and private investments required to turn the bio around, which today total about $250 million. So that sets the stage for the Buffalo Bio Park Project. It encompasses 160 acres along 2.3 miles of the bio immediately west of downtown Houston. The project began in mid-2010 and was completed five years ago. First, the project focused on the channel itself to undo the damage from the 1950s with green infrastructure, such as native trees, native vegetation, and features like flood benches along the bio's meanders. But we had to contend with waters that could be at elevation two, as shown on the left, or elevation 32, as shown on the right, at the same location in the park. I'll add that water has reached about this height a half a dozen times since the park opened. The channel's water also were the focus for the park itself because people are attracted to water. Comes with great risk, whether you're on a river or along the coast, but that's where people want to be. And to that end, the park's design allows people to see the water, get to the water, and even look at it. The design also celebrates the water, such as with this bridge, which ceremoni ceremonially passes over Buffalo Bio with pylons up to the elevation of the 100 year flood. The blue light is part of the park's lunar cycle lighting which shifts lights throughout the park in a lunar dance, depending on the phases of the moon, helping people understand the connection between the moon's gravitational pull and the tidally influenced waters of Buffalo Bio. The park has a robust system of footpaths and multi-use trails that connect destinations within and outside the park. We celebrated every feature possible, even this large storm sewer outfall, which attracts rather than repels people. The playground is a nature playground, giving urban dwelling children the opportunity to experience and connect with nature in ways they simply cannot otherwise. And even the artworks are inspired by nature to reinforce the ability of park users to experience nature Some more highly developed destinations, including Lost Lake, which features gardens by Reed Hobartine, a restored pond, and a building by Page Architects housing a visitor center, public restrooms, and a very popular destination restaurant that generates revenue for park maintenance. 
The park also hosts major civic events like the 4th of July and the occasional rock and roll festival. So this nature focused landscape also must be robust enough to withstand these types of crowds with infrastructure to support Finally, the park includes the historic cistern, a 100-year-old abandoned underground water reservoir that is two acres in size, dropping down into this otherworldly environment to investigate its structure for buildings we were blown away by its beauty. EVP seized the opportunity and raised extra funds to convert it into an immersive temporary art space with amazing Wraps up a two quick tour of the park. If you want to learn more, we received a ULI Global Award for Excellence several years ago, and a detailed case study can be found at ULI's website. The park's flood risk is from a river and not the sea, but it offers themes and lessons that are relevant for Charleston. The first may be considered somewhat odd coming out of unknown Houston, the importance of planning and public engagement. Second, the power of public-private partnerships to realize the full potential of what's happening. Third, the importance of a long-term strategy when dealing with an environment subject to full force of nature. And fourth, working with nature rather than against it to cope with those forces. Hi, this is Amy. I think we're having some trouble hearing. hearing okay. So maybe, I don't know if you can get closer to the mic. I'll get, clo I'll get closer. Okay, perfect, thanks. All right, so on the next slide, The story of Buffalo Bio, Bio Park really begins in 1912 when Houstonians approved a master plan for a new park system focused on the bio, city's bios. The land that would become the park was some of the first acquired under the plan. But the 29 and 30 floods, 35 floods, shifted the focus from parks to flood control, and the land was dedicated as a drainage easement in 1937. Still, if the land had not been in public hands because of that 1912 plan, our project simply would not have been possible. In 2002, BVP produced a new master plan to attract the level of investment required to improve the bio, Buffalo Bio and Beyond, a visionary plan that focused on the bio's 10 most urban miles centered on downtown Houston. The plan's west sector, circled with the red ellipse, would become Buffalo Bio Park. And through extensive engagement with elected officials and the general public, the consensus was to focus on the bio's natural features and passive recreation. Several years later, the consensus, this consensus was the starting point for our park project. After publishing this plan, BBP adopted a holistic planning strategy for all of its projects that emphasized urban design and the bio's connections to the surrounding city. And ULI recognized BBP's approach on the cover of this book with a photo of the Sabine Promenade Project, which immediately preceded Buffalo Bio Park. The Buffalo Bio Park Project began with a more detailed and planning, planning and public engagement process for the park's design and answered questions such as about access points and desires for features like a dog park and public restrooms. In addition, cost estimates were developed to ensure that the project could deliver what the public wanted. Focus on planning has also extended beyond the park to include a citywide program called Bio Greenways. Approved by voters as Buffalo Bio Park was generating excitement in 2012, it expands the concept to include 150 miles of linear parks and trails on eight bios inside the city, $100 million of public funds, and $120 million of matching, mostly private funds have been raised, and the program will be largely completed On the other hand, it is important to note that one century after 1912, neither the city nor the flood control district acting on their own could realize the true potential of this 160 acre civic asset. That took a public private partnership, including the city, county and BVP that resulted in a combined investment of $75 million. BVP's work already was based on these types of partnerships, but Rich and Nancy Kinder took things to a different level. They were monitoring BBP's progress on earlier projects and saw the land's true potential. They approached the three entities with an $30 million catalyst grant 
if and only if the three entities entered into a binding legal agreement to define funding, roles, and responsibilities for quick realization of the improvements and the park's ongoing maintenance and Most important issue for the Kinders was a funded maintenance plan. This is true of all park projects that the Kinder Foundation funds, but was especially important in this case because of the risk of flooding. So as SWA Group was designing the park, ETM Associates was projecting the cost of maintaining each area to ensure that the designs could be affordably maintained. This plan was translated into an owner's manual that details how often the grass is mowed, the litter picked up, and what to do after high water events is legally binding and enforceable in a court of law. Notably, BBP maintains and operates the park using city funds and the flood control district maintains. Due to costs from major floods that were addressed by a maintenance reserve set aside for those events, the planning, design and engineering strategy was to work with nature rather than against it. In the bottom right, note the tow wood used to re reinforce the base of the natural slopes. The flood control district used more readily available riprap instead. BVP also uses materials like concrete and galvanized steel that can withstand flood events. Even the trail lights in this photo are designed to survive going underwater. All of this begs the question of whether this effort was worth it. In other words, did the project's benefits exceed its costs? I'm going to answer that question through four lens. First, Hurricane Harvey, which tested all of our design and maintenance planning strategies. Second, did the park attract new private investment? Third, did the public adopt the park? In other words, did people use it? And fourth, did the park measurably improve our city's quality of life and over Hurricane Harvey hit less than two years after the park opened. The red outline is the park's boundary, and you can see that everything was underwater during this 2000 year storm. In fact, trees literally drowned because they were underwater. Fortunately, Houston's flood regulations meant that none of our buildings flooded. But the big surprise was the silt. We had included post flood silt removal in our maintenance budget, but not at this scale. Harvey's waters rose 40 feet and stayed high for weeks. The result was seven feet of silt in some areas. Before we leave this slide, note the people. As soon as the trail was cleared, walkers, joggers, and cyclists were back in the park because in less than two years, it had become central to their quality of life. While the scale of Harvey could not have been predicted, the owner's manual provided a path forward without finger pointing or each partner knew what it needed to do, and there were even some funds set aside for major floods. The left image shows BVP's contractor collecting silt into one of a dozen huge piles. Note the excavator for a sense of scale. 3,000 truckloads of silt were hauled off. The right side shows the flood control district's work along the channel. It had to wait for a federal disaster grant because of the countywide scale of damage the district was facing. Thankfully, most of the channel held up, but some areas required repair because the toe of some slopes failed or no reinforcement had been added. On a more positive note, and despite the setback from Harvey, the $75 million investment in the park has attracted approximately $3 billion of high quality, mixed use urban development that is now in construction. Three of the images are of construction directly abutting the park. The lower right is different. A new luxury apartment complex about a half a mile from the park that is branding itself with Buffalo Bio, something that just simply would not have happened. Finally, Houstonians have truly embraced the park and during the pandemic, it has seen intense use from sunrise to past sunset. The park has also opened our eyes to the kind of quality of life we can and should enjoy and the beautiful city Houston can be resulting in an emerging new image for my hometown. Thank you. And I'll now, now turn it over to Kim. Thanks, Guy. Um, and thank you all for joining us this morning. I am delighted both to be here, but then also specifically to follow Guy and Tess. Um, 
who perfectly set the stage for what I wanted to talk about, which is the respective roles of the public and private sector um, in planning for and implementing resilience and how those plans and implementation strategies need to reflect the value that is generated for all of those parties in order to secure the financing that's necessary to advance. Next slide, please. Quick orientation, hr &A Advisors, where I'm a partner, is an economic development, real estate, and public policy consulting firm that really focuses on the intersection of the public and private sectors for implementation. Next slide. We have a strong practice in resilience and recovery uh, that covers both capacity building through projects like uh, coordinating HUD's National Disaster Resilience Competition, to working with communities to create strategies to become more just and resilient. We've worked with 12 of 100 resilient cities, 25 cities across the country, um, as well as 1NYC and Climate Ready Boston to prepare those communities uh, for future resilience investment. And then also supporting communities around implementation as we've done with the Gem Tilling neighborhood of New Orleans and we're working on in Lower Manhattan currently. Next slide, please. Now, of course, why are we here you know, we recognize that the number of natural disasters worldwide has been increasing steadily, uh, growing to from just under 300 a year in 1980 to over 800 a year in 2018. And with that, we're seeing a steady increase in the number of fatalities. Uh, on average, 37,000 fatalities per year in this period, and as well as financial losses. Uh, $350 billion in losses worldwide, um, with a little over half of which uh, are actually insured. Next slide, please. Now, we recognize that under those changing conditions, we need to respond, we need to adapt, but it's also not just the impact on communities and the direct cost of lives and damage that we have to be concerned about, it's that perception of future risk. Um, and with perceptions of risk in specific marketplaces, we also see the risk of the financial system, the market, lenders, insurers, and rating agencies starting to pull back resources from communities at a time when we're most in need of those financial resources to respond and adapt. So how do we start to mitigate that risk, make sure that we can continue to secure the funding needed to advance resilience projects and really protect our communities and our assets? Next slide. So HRNA and our work across the country has really seen five core principles that have been required for successful planning and implementation of resilience strategies, all requiring partnership between the public and private sectors who are motivated all the more uh, by the rapidly changing marketplace in the face of climate change and increased risk. The most self-evident of these is that during the planning and decision-making process, where it's essential that local residents, businesses, and local property owners be engaged in ensuring that physical and policy responses uh, to resilience reflect the experience on the ground as well as priorities felt locally. The next is more about the importance of working in layers at the physical and policy level so that we can be sure that we're implementing independently effective solutions, build in build in redundancy across our systems for maximum protection, and that recognize that our holy grail of prote protected shorelines is gonna take time. It's gonna take a lot of resources and we can't wait until then in, in order to take action. Um, that means that we're ensuring community members have a plan and the social contacts they need to respond to and recover from disasters. It also means that we're incorporating physical adaptations uh, at the infrastructure level within both public and privately owned infrastructure how we build our roadways, stormwater mitigation with private landscape and public parks. And it's about adapting the built infrastructure, adapting privately owned buildings um, through uh, protecting systems, hardening buildings and elevation. Next slide. The third key principle is about making improvements that are part of regular building cycles. We don't need to undertake a district-wide strategy in order to start to take steps forward. We can undertake those improvements over the course of the regular investments we were going to be making anyways. And this is where the public-private partnership also comes to play, where the public sector can step in to help address market failures um, to ensure that there's incentive and financing for the private sector to invest in improvements that will generate broader public benefits. So, for example, what does that mean? So in Washington, D.C., 
Um, they have created a stormwater management program that by leveraging an, an initial stormwater charge provides a credit to new builders who implement more retention and detention as part of their sites. And they can also trade credits to other properties. Um, incentivizing private investors in landscape to address broader public stormwater management and generate savings uh, district and citywide. There are other public sources uh, like PACE financing that provides a public vehicle for funding energy efficiency improvements over the course of building upgrades and that can include risk mitigation in some jurisdictions. Um, and you can really bring this scale of public and private collaboration um, together at a district level via bids and other associations that can implement um, the kinds of public realm improvements that they would generate over the normal course of business. Next slide, please. But larger scale initiatives also provide an opportunity to generate multiple benefits for the various public and private partners that need to be involved in implementation. The Gentilly Resilience District uh, in a low-lying mixed income neighborhood of Northern New Orleans is a pilot project designed to address chronic flooding and support inclusive revitalization. Um, it was launched with a $141 million uh, award through the National Disaster Resilience Competition in 2015 is really focused on recognizing that flood mitigation efforts can be leveraged to improve quality of life and neighborhood mitigation. And in order to do that, layers uh, integrated parkland and open space, seven different urban water sites, along with homeowner retrofit grants that address the built environment and a workforce pro program that connects residents with implementation of all of these investments. Next slide. The reason that these multiple benefits are so essential is not just um, because of the political support that they generate for implementation, but because they open up projects for a greater variety of financing tools that are necessary to get projects completed. There's no such thing as free money. Financing is dependent on capturing the benefits that repay an initial upfront investment. And there are a range of different benefits that resilience investments generate, which in turn compel different kinds of funding sources from public, and, uh, public private, and philanthropic sources. On the, on the private side, certainly direct revenue can increase, or direct improvements can increase rents and sales along the lines of what we were just talking about in Alice Beach. Um, that can be financed through loans and equity investments. Efficiency gains can be advanced in public private partnerships with the PACE loan. Um, resili resilience at the, at the district level uh, can generate additional indirect revenues on the private side. And that, that value generation can be captured uh, to fund upfront public investment in resilience through public land development, assessment districts, TIF, et cetera. Um, the, the ideal, uh, which is a, still somewhat challenging to access is financing against avoided losses. So recognizing that spending now to make our projects more resilient is going to save on uh, future losses as well as save on insurance payouts. Um, this is still a somewhat nascent uh, uh, a strategy for funding public or private programs that we saw our first resilience bonds floated in 2019. Um, and I would expect to see this becoming more frequently used as the markets, as insurers, as the uh, ratings agencies get more sophisticated about quantifying the potential benefits of specific physical improvements. And finally, there are the social benefits uh, through open space, cleaner air, direct services, workforce development, et cetera, um, that provide uh, direct and indirect benefits to communities. Those can be difficult to quantify um, but can be captured and supported through uh, accessing taxes that are paid by the public sector as well as philanthropic contributions. Next slide. Um, so one illustration of how these different components come together, this is the Lower Manhattan Climate Resiliency Study that is underway right now, although many of the principles um, are those that we see taking place in coastal locations around the country. Um, and some of these principles actually uh, took place within the West Edge district development as we thought about financing there. We see potential for building level improvements uh, that provide uh, value to private owners by increasing operating efficiencies, as well as enhancements in green streets, new open space, uh, more tree canopy that both mitigate stormwater management, um, but also create substantial social benefits for the community and value for the adjacent property owners. And that value can be captured to offset the cost of those upfront uh, public investments 
through tax increment financing. This again was one of the tools that was incorporated into West Edge's public realm um, and infrastructure investments in order to make that upfront investment possible. Next slide. But one of the greatest sources of value um, uh, really is comes from publicly owned land along the waterfront, both as a means of implementing the physical improvements that we're talking about um, and a means of generating value uh, to pay for the, the, the protection. Um, now in Manhattan, we don't actually have the advantage of the publicly owned land that uh, other locations that are grappling with coastal flood protection have. So, you know, we don't have something to scale of say a union pier uh, to work with as we're thinking about what our physical and financial strategies are. Um, for that reason, in order to achieve the lower Manhattan resilience strategy that I was just showing, we're actually exploring putting in fit new fill to create new land around the edge of the island. Um, that land itself then becomes the new open space, that is the public amenity, uh, provides the space for stormwater mitigation, adds value for upland land, and also uh, generates potential opportunity for new development uh, and value. Um, those, that scale of site is incredibly important, that publicly owned property on the waterfront is incredibly important, um, and in collaboration uh, with the private sector and public partners can become an integral part of the overall resilience strategy. Thank you. And with that, I think I'm passing the torch to Keith here. Thank you, Kate. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna be talking, my name is Keith Bowers and I'm with Biohabitats and I will be talking about some, some both broad scale initiatives and site specific initiatives in adapting to sea level rise and increased storm surges. And I'm gonna take the focus to opportunities to reinvest in green infrastructure, ecosystem services and biodiversities. And I'll, I'll do this in three different ways. One, we'll talk about managed retreat. Two, we'll talk about repurposing infrastructure. And three, we'll talk about moving to net zero carbon. Next slide, please. So we know Charleston in particular has experienced over the last uh, 10 years, some uh, pretty major flooding events. We see that we've uh, had a 1.07 foot uh, sea level rise in the past hundred years, but almost half of that's come in the last 20 years. So. It, is, it means that the rate of sea level rise is increasing faster than it has in the past. Um, and I, I think we've also heard from Mark Wilbert earlier in one of the uh, earlier sessions talk about what Charleston is doing in terms of sea level rise and, and storm surge protection. And, and when they started off, they were looking at two feet as sort of the maximum. And now I believe they've increased that to three feet so that we know it's coming, it's coming faster than we expected and it's potentially gonna be higher than we expected. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I'd like to uh, talk about first is this idea of managed retreat or providing room to grow. I think it's something that's not discussed much and there's many reasons why. You know, being on the coast is one of the primary reasons that we live here and we all enjoy being right on the edge of the coast. So the issue of retreating away from the edge is personal for many people. It has huge economic ramifications and in many cases it's really politically charged but I do believe it's something we need to be thinking about and beginning the discussion on. Next slide, please. So when we think about managed retreat, not only are we thinking about that from being right on the coast as the image on the left shows after Sandy, after Superstorm Sandy hit New York and the Rockaways, but also we need to think about some of our inland communities that also suffer from from uh, changing precipitation events, increased flooding, uh, such, as, such as Church Creek, which is the image on the right here in Charleston. Um, I do believe that there's a timeline associated with managed retreat that we need to be thinking about. It's taken us 100, 150 years to develop our landscape and to get us into this situation. 
it's not gonna, it's gonna take us a while to get back out and manage retreat. We need to think about that on a time scale of probably 20 to 50 years. And so now is the time to begin thinking about it. And we need to think about it strategically. Not everywhere do we need to retreat from the coastline. In certain areas, we want to stay right on the coast because of the investment we've already made. In other areas, it may make more sense. And lastly, we need to think about equity and inclusion and the environmental justice issues that are associated with managed retreat. Next slide, please. So how do we make this happen? Well, first of all, we need to do a good analysis and think about how we repurpose the landscape, how we take areas that may have repetitive flooding or are on the coast and how do we repurpose that landscape to turn it into public park land or areas where we can restore and provide that sort of ecological uh, attributes that have um, been missing in the past. Another way of doing it is thinking about transfer development rights. So economically, people that are on the coast now have a way of recouping their investment and monies they put into their properties. We need to think about upzoning or increasing density in places that are not prone to flooding. And we need to incentivize development in those flood proof areas while decentivizing development in areas at risk. And we can do that through many mechanisms like taxes, development fees, building cur codes, permitting, et cetera. And we also need to begin incorporating retreat scenarios in comprehensive plants. It's something that right now we need to start doing. So we have this 20 to 30 to 40 year time frame to figure that out. And then lastly, we need to be thinking about our transportation and essential services and how do we incentivize or de-incentivize those to allow managed retreat in those strategic places where we think that that's the best, best plan going forward. Next slide, please. So going back to Superstorm Sandy and the Rockaways, one of the things that they're looking at is how do they retreat back off of, of the shoreline along there and how do they repurpose that area to create a secondary and primary dune system. Next slide, please. But how do they then uh, up, up zone or densify areas behind that area and do it in an ecologically sensitive and appropriate way? And so even FEMA's come out with building community resilience with nature-based solutions. So we're moving in that direction of retreating somewhat off the coast, redensifying areas that are flood proof and using nature-based design to help guide that redevelopment. Next slide, please. So I'm also gonna be talking, next, next click please. I'm also gonna be talking about repurposing infrastructure or what I call enhancing the ecotone. And the ecotone is that transition area between two or more biological communities. And I think that if we think about our coastline as this ecotone, we need to be thinking about how it's interconnected both to the water and to the land, how it can be multifunctional and how it should be adaptable. Next slide, please. We know that in many communities around the country and around the world that are, that are living on the edge, they're already beginning to think about adaptation, multifunctionality, and, and connection. This happens to be in North Richmond and San Francisco Bay as part of the Resilient by Design Challenge that was uh, undertaken about a year or two ago. We were on a team in North Richmond looking at a year-long effort of uh, areas that were disinfected vested in uh, that had environmental justice issues um, and how could we then reinvest in those areas, reconnect people back to the shoreline, but do it in a way that was resilient to sea level rises in San Francisco Bay, which in some cases are projected to be up to nine feet um, and also the storm surges there. And so there's these precedents being set, I think around the country to begin thinking about all these things. Next slide, please. And as Kate mentioned, you know, the big U um, in Manhattan and, and what they're doing there, here where they're, what they're looking at is both the sort of shoreline of, of lower Manhattan, but as Kate also mentioned, they're looking at, at placing fill to provide that sort of uh, public space that provides that storm surge protection and sea level rise protection there. 
Boston Harbor has done the same thing. They're looking at ways that they can be more resilient to sea level rise and storm surge protection by creating more public space around the water's edge, by taking that public space and reconnecting it inward toward the core of the city and inward even further, and how it all works as one unit. Next slide, please. And even in Norfolk, uh, Norfolk, which houses the largest naval base in the world, they're recognizing that they need to do something about sea level rise too. They also recognize the equity and inclusion issues or the environmental justice issues that are associated with that. And so they're working on plans right now to also use nature-based design and, and gray infrastructure in combination to provide ways to not only enhance ecosystem services, but provide protection along the coast. Next slide, please. So here in Charleston, we, we know uh, that the Army Corps of Engineers has come out with their three by three study uh, and looking at replacing a wall around the perimeter of Charleston. And imagine the wall is a counter proposal to that core study. And it's based on using nature-based or end urban context sensitive design elements to provide that sea level rise and storm surge protection. But more importantly, it also addresses and reconnects the interior of Charleston in thinking about flooding and the flooding issues in the interior and how can we make this all one unified project that thinks about water from one aspect. We think about rainwater, stormwater, potable water, wastewater, um, water in our estuaries and our streams and our rivers. And, and we need to be thinking about that from a comprehensive standpoint. This was an effort that Biohabitats, Design Works, One Architecture and ATM Engineering got together and, and put forward. The other part of this was, was equity and inclusion and finding ways to open that discussion as well and thinking about whatever is done with Charleston that we need to enter those discussions as well. Next slide, please. So one of the ideas that was sort of pioneered out in San Francisco and is taken hold is this idea of, of a horizontal levee. And we're all used to a levee that's most that, that's predominantly sort of this this dike or pyramid of earth that protects us. And the idea behind a horizontal levee is to provide a gradual transition between the seaward side and the levee all the way down into the water. And what this does over time is it allows when sea level rise happens, it allows these marsh systems and oyster reefs and other aquatic habitat to begin to slowly migrate up slope. So we don't lose that really important ecosystem service or that protection that those, those uh, uh, communities provide. This happens to show an illustration on Brittle Bank Park of how employing a, a, a horizontal levee as part of Brittle Bank Park could provide that protection uh, similar to what the wall would do, but in this case, still providing recreational, passive, active, uh, recreational access to the park, but also providing ways for the ecosystem to migrate upslope over the next 30 to 50 years as we experience sea level rise. Next slide, please. Similarly, we're looking at ways to uh, provide that protection from storm surges instead of the wall or instead of raising the battery or instead of having a, a stone uh, rock uh, pyramid out in front of the battery, what if we looked at it in a way to enhance, again, the aquatic habitat of, of uh, the Cooper River and, and the estuary here? What if we could employ oyster reefs and uh, um, uh, bird colonies and wetland uh, restoration and submerged aquatic vegetation in combination with the rock and stone to provide both that stormwater protection and provide really valuable and important habitat and do it in a way that also, again, provides recreational aspects for, for the um, uh, public here. And then similarly, this port canal looking out over where the cigar factory is, for those of you that know Charleston, 
uh, how can we find ways interior to the, the edge of the coastline to provide not only in a public amenity in this green way, but also to store stormwater and slowly release that back out into the river. So all these opportunities exist that would enhance both the quality of life in Charleston, but would also provide great opportunities to restore some of the ecosystem services that we've lost over time. Next slide, please. Similarly, thinking about bulkheads and hard urban edges where we may not wanna retreat off the coast where we already have invested in parkland, there are plenty of ways of, of, of repurposing some of these uh, walls, this gray infrastructure to provide habitat along the coastline or along that edge. And even taking some areas that have been paved over in the past um, and repurposing them for stormwater infiltration and making them a part of the sort of civic edge of a lot of our coastlines. Next slide, please. We've also been researching and experimenting with ways to bring back aquatic life along our urban edges, such as what we call these bio huts on the left, which provide opportunities for juvenile fish to hide and, and, and uh, feed. Uh, so they're not preyed on by the larger fish. They would typically do that in marsh grass, but when we lose marsh grass along the urban edges, there's nowhere for these juvenile fish to go. Uh, so they get preyed on at, at higher rates. So there are ways of thinking about how to enhance some of these urban shorelines, maybe in the, the new terminal that's being built along the coast of Charleston. There's also ways of enhancing even those hardened shorelines or oyster restoration. We're, I think, blessed in Charleston where we still have a lot of oyster reefs, but many parts of the East Coast have lost a lot of their oyster reefs, which provide not only uh, protection from uh, storm surges, but also provide water quality benefits. There are also ways of, of thinking about restoring our oyster reefs out in the water's edge to provide, again, both, both some protection for us and some of these ecosystem benefits. Next slide, please. And then repurposing some of the infrastructure. There's a lot of exciting uh, ways of doing that and a lot of exciting projects that are beginning to take shape around the country. The image on the left is a pier in Baltimore where the proposal is to create uh, wetlands on top the pier where water is pumped up and filtered through the wetlands to take out some of the nutrients. Uh, that cause a lot of the dead zones in some of these water bodies and then the water is cascaded back down into the harbor itself to increase dissolved oxygen and, and help enable and enhance aquatic life. And all this is done by using solar panels to pump that water up. On the right is an image of Pier 26 in New York City along the Hudson River. Uh, it's being constructed right now. Olin partnership uh, landscape architects out of Philadelphia did the design biohabitats help and the image you can see on the uh, end of the pier is a tidal wetland that was built into the pier to provide educational benefits and research for um, students in New York City. So it's a way of repurposing some of these piers or some of these infrastructures on the edge to provide not only civic space but also to provide opportunities for enhancing, again, the ecological communities, the biological communities that exist around here. Next slide, please. And then this is a, another project out in San Francisco Bay where, again, they're, they're gonna be experiencing huge sea level rises. And this is repurposing two, or actually two, three piers out there, piers 30 through 32. And it's this idea of elevating these piers using the existing structures that are already there. And in this case, creating a housing community on top of this and doing it in such a way where you, you create this protective cove that again, provides opportunities to reestablish and restore wetlands and enhance the aquatic habitat here. Um, so these kinds of projects are, be, are being thought of and proposed throughout the country. Next slide, please. And finally, when we think about inland areas, we need to be thinking about uh, 
these kinds of projects where we repurpose landscapes to provide stormwater management and doing it in a way that they're not just stormwater management basins, but they actually provide many different types of ecological benefits and habitat for some of our terrestrial and, and uh, aquatic and amphibian species. This is a project in Maryland where they took uh, an abandoned agricultural field and repurposed it for uh, wetlands and for uh, conveying stormwater from upstream development. Next slide, please. And on the other coast out in Oregon, the same thing is going on where they're repurposing farmland there uh, to increase, in this case, the Otter Point estuary to provide that kind of stormwater management and buffer uh, to sea level rise and in doing it in such a way that enhances and increases habitat. Next slide, please. And then finally, I'd like to just talk briefly about moving to net zero carbon or what we might want to call catalyzing a regenerative economy. It's great if we employ all the things that I just talked about, but if we don't do it in a way where we're moving toward net zero carbon, we're still contributing to the problem that we're trying to solve. And so one of the things that we could do through policy and through other incentives is to move toward a net zero carbon um, uh, uh, development pattern. And I think that involves both looking at not only do we wanna make our buildings and how we develop the landscape operate from a net zero carbon perspective, but we also need to be thinking about the embodied energy that goes into how we develop the coastline and working toward being net zero carbon in terms of that embodied energy and the types of materials that we use and how we transport materials to the site. Next slide, please. Uh, the image on the left is the Candida building. It's a living building challenge building in, in uh, Atlanta in Georgia Tech's campus. We worked on that with with uh, um, Lord Arc Sargent, the architects, and Andrew Pogon, who is the landscape architects on this building. And it is uh, net zero carbon in terms of its energy usage. You can see the solar panel canopy on top of the building here. And there's no reason why we can't incentivize and, and in fact require these kinds of buildings to be built along our coastline. And then finally, I think we need to be thinking about if we are gonna to go to net zero carbon, we need to find ways to generate the energy through solar and through wind turbines and finding ways where again, we can use the advantages of being on the, on the coastline to generate the energy we need in a renewable resource way. Next slide, please. Living on the edge, adapting to sea level rise and increased storm surges, we can do this. And we can do it in a way that not only benefits us and protects us from, from uh, intimate sea level rise, but we can also do it in a way that protects and restores the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And uh, I would uh, invite all the panelists to turn their mics and uh, cameras on as well, please. I thought that was excellent, excellent. We've got some great questions here. Uh, I know some of you, uh, uh, Tess in particular and Guy have answered these questions, but I think for the benefit of the whole, we might go ahead and just go through these a little bit. Uh, Tess, the, the question came about the fortified standard work and how well it worked during the extreme, extreme events, particularly Hurricane Michael. Uh, I know you answered that, but if you wanna just debrief on that just a little bit, please. Yeah, so we were really fortunate with Hurricane Michael. We didn't see um, much significant damage at all. We lost, you know, some houses lost a few shutters, but um, we were impacted um, with our home building program. You know, there were some significant delays because a lot of the labor force um, was impacted, material delays and things like that. So, um, but just, you know, physically, we did not see much damage. And then um, someone asked about, you know, fortified and kind of a little bit more detail about that. So as I mentioned, mentioned, we're kind of going above and beyond um, the Florida B building code. We're adding more concrete um, and reinforcing with less spacing in between. Um, so whereas, you know, the vertical reinforcing bars in the block 
might be 36 inches by code. We're going like 24 inches. Um, they're also, we're also adding more straps at our roof trusses and then doors and windows have to meet uh, wind pressures that are between 10 and 20 miles over what is required by code. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Janice was asking about the reuse of the silt and, and I saw you replied, Guy, but you want to follow up on that just a little bit? That was a great question. You're, you're muted, Guy. Sorry about that. There you go. There you go. Uh, and I, I'm going to get closer to my microphone. I apologize about the poor audio. Uh, the background is that the Harris County Flood Control District for decades has been uh, implementing a regional detention. Uh, these are detention basins that can cover as much as 100 or 200 acres. And what they've uh, done is entered into partnerships with concrete companies who actually mine the silt in those detention basins and use it in the making of concrete. Uh, so this whole network of relationships was already in place um, after Harvey hit and BVP's contractor partnered with a concrete company uh, to receive the silt and, and use it in its, uh, in its making of concrete, which reduces costs and, and of course uh, provides a repurposing of the silt. Excellent, thank you. There's a question from Kelly. Uh, I think this is maybe for Keith. Uh, you, you've been talking about uh, equity uh, uh, and inclusion along the, as it relates to this and maybe Kate, but um, in regard to the uh, repurposing of the developments that are flood proof, if these areas are predominantly owned by Charleston minority natives, what policies can be set to prevent gentrification? Does anybody have a thought or an experience? Or? I, think, I think it's a, a big issue. Uh, I think we're still trying to tackle that issue, gentrification. Um, along the coast and thinking about how we how we re-envision the coast in an equitable and, and an inclusionary way. I don't have the answers right now, but I think it 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 takes a uh, um, uh, collective effort amongst everyone. And when we think about the coastline, we need to be thinking about the interior as well, and they need to work together. We can't just have policies that are specific to the coast and not have those same policies, um, not only within the same jurisdiction, but regionally. And so we need to be thinking about this from a regional perspective. Absolutely. Thank you. Kate, you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Keith. It, it's one of the most significant challenges that we face. I mean, in addition to the physical and financial challenges, is how do we sustain the communities that have been there? Um, and in some ways, it's you know, almost easier if it's already subsidized housing. I mean, I know that in, in Norfolk, this, in the St. Paul's area, they've been able to access a HUD Choice Neighborhoods Initiative grant in order to rebuild um, low-lying subsidized housing at a better level of quality and to be more resilient, but that doesn't work if you've got a variety of single family homes. Um, I think one of the things that we're gonna have to think about given that the way that one builds in affordability um, is, you know, well, either home ownership, which at least is building in equity, or it is um, cross-subsidizing with market rate development. And to make that happen, you're usually talking about a denser kind of housing product than a lot of coastal areas have been seeing. And you know, thinking about how that form gets integrated into flood protections probably needs to be part of the long-term conversation. Uh, excellent. Guy, you, anything in, from Houston's perspective and where you are? Well, as, as uh... Kate was talking, I was thinking about a uh, initiative here that may have some promise. Uh, it's a community land trust model where the ownership of the land is actually turned over to, a, to common ownership. And I think that possibly could be public, freeing up uh, uh, you know, public funds to invest in elevating the property and whatever, but the residents continue to own their structures similar to how folks own a condominium. And I'm not an expert on this, but there may be some applicability of that strategy in these neighborhoods where the literally the ground itself needs work, but you can't use public funds on that private property. Just a thought. Interesting. 
Interesting. Um, Michael Maher had a great question, I think, too, and it relates to uh, subsidence as it relates uh, in parallel to the sea level rise. And I know, uh, as they say, and we don't, we, we experience subsidence, but not like Louisiana does, right? They're losing like 100 feet a day of uh, shoreline, uh, having been down there for a while. I, I know some of that. But so, uh, I guess Keith, you want to talk about the, these investments and and I guess the challenges of it, and is it the, the challenge of uh, it um, sort of slowing down subsidence possibly? I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure that that uh, any of these will slow down subsidence, uh, but I do. We have we we've, we've been working actually in in Galveston Island south of Houston, where subsidence is a huge issue there, and thinking about these nature-based designs and how, I mean, they, it has to be part of the equation when we're looking at um, sea level rise. We need to not only look at sea level rise we need and storm surge, but we also need to look at subsidence, but then also depending on sediment transport in some areas, we might accrete sediment that might offset some of the subsidence or sea level rise. So all that needs to be taken into consideration when you're doing the modeling for these projects. Um, and so if subsidence is, is exasperating sea level rise, uh, then you've got to design your nature-based uh, solutions to uh, um, accommodate that. And there are ways of doing that. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Guy, you have a... Well, since uh, Keith mentioned Galveston, I'll, I'll just note that uh, the, the Houston area in general has suffered from very severe subsidence because of groundwater pumping. And uh, 30 years ago, uh, we uh, transferred or began the transfer from wells providing our water supply to uh, uh, surface water. That's the reason that underground reservoir I mentioned in my presentation was abandoned. And uh, because it was served by uh, wells surrounding it. Uh, we had areas along Galveston Bay sink as much as seven feet before the groundwater pumping was stopped. And uh, I think on a regional basis, it's still an issue because we have counties upslope of Houston that are still pumping groundwater and having some impacts, but we're doing a pretty good job of beginning to manage that situation. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, and then I guess with Janice, of course, she's got to ask some great questions here about uh, the time frame here. The uh, how do we consider the deep adaptive capacity for post twenty one hundred sea levels, particularly given the service life of investments, which will easily extend into the time frame based on Charleston's history. I guess the growth out into the rivers. I'm assuming that's what Janice is talking about. And how might we think creatively about the degree of change required? Where we hold the line and think about decommissioning and rewilding where we cannot. Uh, Keith, I think that's maybe, <laughs> maybe aimed at you mostly. Maybe you can follow up with Guy as well. Yeah, well, all that's all that's music to my ears. I think we have a really hard time thinking, even thinking past a five year or 10 year comprehensive plan, right? So to be thinking 70, 80 years in the future. And in fact, that's exactly what we did with Galveston, where we modeled. Um, uh, 50 to 75 years into the future to, to look at those, those issues. And, and, and sort of I go back to Andres Duaney, which um, you know, was instrumental in the design uh, for uh, the development that Tess was talking about. He, he reminded me, uh, we, we've worked with him in the past and he sort of reminded me that whatever footprint we put down on the landscape is the one that's gonna last the longest. It's not the house you build or it's not the refrigerator in your house, it's that footprint. And so I think Janice is exactly right. We need to be thinking about, you know, what, what, what footprint or footprints are we putting down now in 20, that, that will still be around in 2100 and how do we do it in a really thoughtful, um, integrative and collective way. And that's the challenge we all have right now. And I think one of the challenges we've had thinking that long-term is also how do you motivate payment for projects like that. I mean, if yeah. a developer is financing on a 30 year cycle, you're not thinking about a, a you know, 50 to 100 year timeframe. Um, and 
while the concern about risk in markets is immediately very challenging, um, you know, I think reinsurers in particular are starting to look very carefully at this since they're the ones who end up being on the hook, not just in this 30 year time frame, but later on. Um, so hopefully we'll start seeing some more creative financial tools around this too. Yeah, excellent. Tess, um, do, when they were talking about, you're muted by the way, um, what Keith was talking about and the value of this infrastructure, do the folks at Alice Beach know all these, about these elements and the value that it is actually done to enhance where they live and how, how they how they live? Well, I think Alice is, um, you know, really design focused community. So I don't know that it's what's initially bringing them into our sales center, but I think we do a really great job of educating our buyers. And I think they do definitely believe in those principles that we've established. Excellent. And they, they realize the value though. That's what I'm right. saying. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, let's see here. Ken has a statement in here about uh, infrastructure. I heard a lot of, there was a lot of great words. So I wrote these down. This is not necessarily in any particular order, but what we heard today were layers, intersection, balance, adapting, scale, infrastructure, we were just talking about, nature, thinking, solutions, watershed, time, urgency, and retreat. And I like Keith had a word about pioneering. Right now we are, we're sort of pioneering too, right? We're, we're doing all that as we're going. The investment, return, stormwater management, and development patterns. There's 60 people on this call and I would like for, based on all those words that y'all all said and, and are coming through, what, uh, I'll start with Keith and go to Tess. How about that? What would you like for these ambassadors, these potential ambassadors on this call to go back and go out in the world and say about this series and what we need to be doing for our resilience? Yeah, I guess it, it goes back to my three points. One is, one is thinking about managed retreat and how we think about that over the, over the next uh, 30 to 50 years and, and how, we, how, how can we begin having a, a civil conversation about what that means and being strategic uh, about that. I think second of all, uh, really relying on nature-based green infrastructure is the primary driver for how we deal with sea level rise and storm surge protection, um, because I think it has very, you know, very many benefits, um, and and it's it's uh, one of the uh, great ways that we can begin to not only provide protection for the investment we made along the coast, but again, protection and restoration of our aquatic resources and aquatic communities. And then thirdly, how do we move to this net zero carbon uh, economy and lifestyle? And how do we begin employing those measures now in, a, in unison and in addition to the other ones that I talked about? Thank you. Kate. Um, I would come back to um, the importance of the public and the private sectors working together on this. I, I think for a long time, again, because these different horizons for risk that people think about, um, you know, you've seen property owners invest in their building and make those resilient, while the public sector has tended to think more about the public infrastructure. Um, but they, those need to go hand in hand in terms of the longer term sustainable strategies. Um, and I think as um, it becomes increasingly difficult for all of us to protect and pay for the kinds of assets that we have and that we see as having potential in the community going forward, um, we need to see both advocacy and collaboration on the private side with public partners to make sure that the funding is there to get the work done um, and that we're thinking more creatively about our physical adaptation so that it's not isolated within building and in the public realm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. We haven't talked about assets, but this nature that we all are part of is the biggest asset, right? So we need to be conscious of how we do that. Guy, you're, you're, 
Well, I'm going to make a couple of observations beyond uh, what I said in my presentation. I, I think first there's a just very basic lesson in uh, reintroducing city dwellers to the natural environment. Uh, here in Houston, as I said, we turned our back on our bios. And so people didn't really know they existed, didn't understand their function, and didn't understand the problems that were brewing. Uh, so both through Buffalo Bio Park and Bio Greenways, people now see them. They intuitively get what's going on and, and see when the water is rising. Uh, the other really critical issue that's kind of a, a thread, I think, throughout all these presentations is that so often what we're looking for is the silver bullet, uh, the big, bold idea that if we only did that, whatever it is, it's going to solve everything. Uh, we're actually facing that, that uh, situation right now with the Corps of Engineers on two separate uh, threats. One is uh, inland flooding like Hurricane Harvey. The other is coastal surge that, that, that was in Hurricane or has come up with a $30 billion plus solution to coastal surge called the Ike Ike. And, uh, but it's gonna take decades, decades upon decades to finish. And ironically for Buffalo Bio, where Congress authorized a $6 million Corps of Engineers study, they, they are proposing schemes that will again take decades and decades to implement. And the problem is um, we face this threat Next, tomorrow and next week, next month, next year, next decade, and those solutions aren't going to come along quickly enough. And so the big debate in Houston and what ideas that are percolating is about incremental approaches. Again, going back to multiple benefits, thinking about you know, using our infrastructure to provide benefits in multiple ways, and, and an incremental strategy that can begin providing those benefits uh, more quickly. Excellent. Excellent, Guy. Thank you. Tess, how about you? Yeah, I think, you know, to Guy's point, that's definitely the strategy that we took in planning Alice. It's in what incremental ways can we kind of create our vision, look at every aspect through a lens of sustainability. And I think we've demonstrated that, um, you know, it can be really beautiful and it can be very profitable. You know, we've seen, we've been really successful um, in selling this real estate. And I think um, it's, it's that layers and it's the multiple benefits and it's you know being practical, environmental, sustainable and beautiful. Um, and that's really kind of why it's been successful at Alice, I would say. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, the, the environment and the economy aren't mutually exclusive. Right. Shouldn't, shouldn't be, right? They, they should be working hand in hand, so. All right, Amy, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. I think we're really close to the end and uh, I appreciate everybody's time and your effort and your presentations. I thought it was excellent. And uh, we'll uh, I'll turn it over to Amy and thank you very much. Great, thank you everybody. Thanks Steve for moderating. Thanks Keith, Guy, Tess and Kate for providing such great information. I really appreciate y'all. Um, before I let everybody go, just a quick reminder that um, we have two remaining sessions in the series. One is next Tuesday on October 27th, um, and that's going to be um, about embracing and respecting the edge, the path forward in the low country. And we have a, a great slate of local developers who will be talking about these issues from a private sector perspective perspective. So a great follow up to today's conversation. And then on November 12th, um, we will have a conversation about investing in the edge, the changing financial landscape. And our speakers will be Yoon Kim from 427 and Laura Kraft from Heightman. So um, that's what's coming up. Um, I'll send a, a follow up email with some of uh, those links and additional resources later on this afternoon. Um, but thanks everybody for joining us. And um, thanks to our panelists for being sharing your expertise with us this morning. Appreciate you all. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.